Hello, my name is André Fachard. In this talk I will give you an overview on how to emulate classic computers. This is the English version of a German talk I gave at the Humboldt University in Berlin in 2013 as part of the Shift Restore Escape lecture series. I used to be part of the uh, Vice Commodore emulator team, so I use this as, as, as an example. But as my detailed knowledge is uh, a bit outdated, uh, please take the example as it is just as an example. In this talk I will give you uh, some basics of uh, emulation, uh, continuing with uh, Vice specific features, and then use the CIA emulation, the complex interface adapter emulation of the C64 as an uh, example how to emulate uh, accurately and with performance. And I'm going to show some demos and talk a bit more about uh, modern emulators. So what is emulation anyway? Um, there is no clear definition of emulation in IT. It originated uh, by IBM because the System 360 could emulate older 1401 or 1620 systems. That is, um, it could run the programs written for the older systems. What is the difference between emulation and simulation? Uh, my take on this is um, that simulation tries to uh, really do the inner workings of a system so you understand the inner workings of the system uh, more and emulation means you um, have a device that does as if it were the original machine so you can use it uh, as a replacement for the original machine so that's uh, what I think is the difference between emulation and simulation um, so an emulator not necessarily needs to emulate everything 100% uh, Vice is such an emulator for the 8-bit Commodore machines uh, such as the C64, the PET WIC20, CBM2, PLUS4 uh, and others and uh, in some parts with the increasing accuracy uh, of the of the emulation one could probably say that Vice has grown uh, in part uh, into a simulator what is my motivation to do all this? I was motivated uh, by an old game that I started to play when I was at school. We only had a PET 3032 uh, at school where I started programming. And uh, when I left school, uh, I couldn't play this game anymore. Uh, and I was unable to port this game to, to the C64 that I owned at that time and because the performance of the uh, current machines then wasn't um, sufficient for emulation um, the first step actually was uh, to rebuild the pet in hardware uh, which became a story in and itself um, but later when I got my Linux PC um, the step was to really write an emulator so looking at an emulator what needs to be emulated we have to look at the machine and the architecture of the machine and uh, standard computer then um, basically was built out of a central processing unit some memory some IO clock circuitry that, that synchronizes all the components the main active element in the older computer is the processor um, today we have other active elements like DMA IO processors or, or video processors like the, the modern video cards with their accelerators. Um, that is not the case there. Although you could say that the um, Commodore disk drives, which were a computer in, uh, for themselves, um, count as I.O. coprocessors. When you now look at the CPU as the main active element of an emulated system, you need to understand what the CPU or the processor actually is and does. Uh, the processor is um, a state machine mainly um, and it runs uh, so it has a state which consists of a number of registers and it uh, runs a program that, that uses this state and, um, and changes this state um, the, the state model for the, for the 6502 processor for example has a program counter um, uh, 
which is the memory address of the uh, w where the program is actually uh, running from, the current address, um, the stack pointer, accumulator, some index registers, and a status register. Um, the program that the processor uh, executes is sometimes uh, written in a, in a higher language, um, but if it's being written in a higher language, it is uh, often compiled into machine code. If it's not interpreted, then it's compiled into machine code, uh, which is directly executable by the by the CPU. And um, but for the older computers, um, where interpreting interpreting code was uh, slow, and compilers weren't that efficient and and not that much available. It was often the case that they were being programmed in assembler language. Um, basically, all the demos I, I will be showing later on are only programmed in assembler language. So um, I've given some example of uh, an assembler language machine code uh, here, which is a sample of the Commodore PET uh, ROM. And here you have the address in memory. F0D5, which is an hexadecimal notation. Then you have uh, in these columns uh, one to three bytes uh, for the actual operation, which is the opcode uh, and the and the uh, parameter for the for the opcode. And in this case, the parameter itself is the operand, also for the operation. Uh, you have a symbolic name for an address. Which you can use in in, in uh, to add uh, as a symbolic address uh, in the assembler language, and then you have a kind of mnemonic um, name for the for the opcode, and uh, it is normally standard definition how the machine code is written out in assembler language. In this case, the LDA hash dollar two zero means load accumulator. Uh, uh, immediate, that is, take the value that is stored directly after the opcode and store it in the accumulator register. So, um, the point is, um, these processes cannot um, execute uh, each of the operations in, in a single clock cycle, but they are broken down into uh, simple steps, which are hard-coded uh, in the processor. So um, for each for each of the clock cycles, you need to understand what the processor actually does. And uh, for example, you have this uh, um, opcode here, um, ADC1234, which means add to accumulator with carry. Uh, at an absolute address 1234, which means uh, look up the value that is stored in this address in memory and add that one to the to the accumulator. This actually takes five cycles. In the first cycle, the opcode is loaded so that the processor knows what, what to do. Uh, in the next two cycles, the address is loaded from memory into the CPU. And then in the, in the fourth cycle, um, actually the, the value stored in that address is being read and in the fifth cycle this value that has, that has just been read is being added to the accumulator register. This is in uh, brackets because it's actually hidden behind the load opcode of the next uh, of the next opcode uh, of the next. This operation sequence is actually uh, documented uh, in some data sheets, um, but um, due to the early stages of the internet, when we first wrote the emulator, many of these uh, uh, operation sequences um, had to be found out by experimentation, uh, experimenting on the actual systems and see what each of the opcodes really does. So what has recently been done is this amazing thing on Visual 6502. Here the people have uh, decapitated the chips, taken uh, electron microscope images 
of the different layers of this chip and have reconstructed all the, the layers uh, in, into full detail um, so you can uh, actually load the whole processor with its uh, only 3500 and something uh, transistors uh, into your browser and run it as a JavaScript uh, simulation uh, and actually can, you can run uh, programs uh, within the, this emulator in your browser uh, and you can actually watch each of the signals uh, in this uh, animation that I'm going to show you now. So this is the Visual 6502 website and here you can see the whole processor in its full glory, all the 3500 something transistors um, with all the signals in, in different colors telling uh, whether the signal is on or off and you can actually step through your program here in the simulated memory and see what it really does. Here is the all the uh, register values, here is the memory uh, and you can see everything, you can you can change uh, you see all the different different signals, how they change, how the processor really works in each in each detail. It's really, really amazing. Now that we've seen what the processor really does in, in full detail, uh, what does an emulator then do? An emulator uh, interprets the machine code of the emulated uh, machine it, that is, it does as if it were a processor and executes that code as if. Um, so it has its own set of, of registers and uh, executes each operation um, working on, on this register set. So if you look at this execution sample um, of this uh, uh, opcode here, which we have a 920 load accumulator immediate. Um, we see here the address, we see the code, we see the assembler mnemonic representation, we see the register set, and we see the clock value. And what we've seen is this is broken down into this operation sequence. The first clock cycle takes uh, reads a9 as opcode from the memory as load accu immediate. The second one reads the operand, and the third one transfer, transfers the operand to the accumulator register. Um, what we can see here is it actually takes two cycles, not three. It is because this third cycle is hidden uh, behind the first cycle of the following opcode. So this is a kind of pipelining that the 6502 processor actually does. So. What, what would an emulator do? So we know that the processor actually runs one opcode after the other. It always reads it from the program counter, the PC. So we have a big uh, loop while true. And then uh, the first step is we read the opcode from the address of the program counter, increase the program counter, increase the clock number, and then depending on the opcode, uh, we do what we, ha what we have to do. In this case, um, we read the next value from the program counter, increase the program counter at the same time, set some CPU flags, and also increase the clock cycle. And then we're done. So this is a kind of clockwise emulation. But in a, in a real system, we don't only have the CPU, we also have the other um, systems, subsystems uh, that we have to take care of. In the C64, for example, we have the two CIAs, complex interface adapter, uh, with uh, two timers each. We have the sound interface device, and we have the video uh, chip, the VIC-2. So, Every time we need to uh, increase the clock cycle, we need to take care of all those uh, subsystems as well. I need to tell them, okay, we're one cycle further. Unfortunately, this is totally inefficient. Um, 
because we are running at a PC, um, we're getting uh, not not in a in, in some kind of uh, theoretical uh, system. Um, we get function call overhead. That it, that is each time um, this code is executed, we have a function call. Each time it jumps into these methods, we have a function call. All those function calls have an overhead. Uh, and when we jump out of this loop, this loop might possibly entirely uh, fit into the CPU cache. If we have to jump out of this loop, um, we lose cache locality. Uh, this cache might be uh, reused, invalidated, so it has to be read again once we're coming from back from, from this uh, clock increment function. So, and that is why we need performance optimization to be at the same time, uh, fast and accurate. And at this time, I want to switch from the general uh, emulation section to device commuter emulator. Uh, and then later on explain how we do this fast and accurate simulation in WISE. The history of WISE reaches back to Finnish University in 1993. Started out as April's full stroke um, because then uh, it was put on some Solaris workstations in full screen mode um, as X64 with a, a C64 uh, boot screen. In the early years, the focus was on improving the emulation, making it cycle exact. Uh, what, I, what I've shown in the in the previous slides, so that each cycle really does what the system, uh, or at least emulates what the system uh, in reality does. Windows port was started, hardware level disk drive emulation. As I said, the Commodore disk drives have their own CPU. And the core team was between one and three to four persons, um, with some, some of the names there. Uh, and development was done with the uh, one main maintainer and, and sending patches around. All the, the different uh, uh, developers were doing their own changes, uh, creating a patch file, sending this per mail, and the one main maintainer uh, took care of it all and, and merged it all together. Um, today, it's one of the best C64 and VIC-20 emulators available. The only real PET and CBM2 emulator um, the team consists of 16 people, uh, last time I counted, and it's developed on SourceForge with appropriate infrastructure. Uh, that is a source, uh, source code repository, bug tracker and everything, uh, what you actually need to do a real software development project. So WISE means versatile Commodore emulator and it takes the versatile in its name very seriously. It emulates all the um, different Commodore machines, including the matching disk drives. Um, all are based on the 6502 CPU, but we also have an emulation of the Z80 for the Commodore 128 and the 6809 for the Super Pet, or in, uh, in, in Europe or Germany, Micro Mainframe 9000 machines, which is an 8032 Pet with uh, 6809 daughter board. All those uh, platforms share the same infrastructure code, uh, reuse the same emulation code for the specific uh, chips, like the CIAs are used in the C64, two of them, two of them in the 128, um, the 6522 via, or via versatile interface adapter in the VIC-20, in the PET, and the disk drives and everything. It is multi-platform, uh, Windows, Linux, Solaris, OS2, lots of people have ported it to, to lots of platforms, it's really amazing, uh, which means there is a separation of platform specific code uh, that was introduced um, very early and has uh, enabled us to actually port it to so many different platforms. This platform specific code, of course, is keyboard handling, mapping, video driver, sound, joystick, and uh, even stuff like using the parallel port uh, 
uh, on a PC to connect a real Commodore disk drive. The performance in the beginning was a difficult topic. Early emulators struggled to get a 100% speed emulation, which means that the emulation runs at, at the same speed as the emulated system. Uh, even the several hundred megahertz PC, it was difficult to achieve that, and uh, so short, shortcuts were taken. So, for example, when executing a specific ROM routine, uh, that is uh, some program that is that is um, burned into the firmware of of the machine, uh, the, a shortcut was introduced, uh, so that uh, this was not emulated but run in in optimized C uh, C based code and. Uh, not in 6502 assembler. But uh, when Moore's law um, uh, worked and uh, PCs became faster and faster again, and uh, then we had fully emulated disk drives with, with their own processor, uh, video effects with double size, blurry TV set emulation, and everything. Today's hardware is no problem at all. But as we can see, this was not the case in 1997. Uh, changes in Y0.12.0, almost 90% of the emulation code has been rewritten. Uh, drastic measures have to be taken sometimes. And uh, what you can see here, you have a new 6510 emulation, which is the 6502 derivative in the, in the, 60, uh, in the C Commodore 64. Completely rewritten video emulations. Uh, much better VIC-2 video chip, uh, mostly rewritten from scratch and can now handle even more features. Um, new SID emulator uh, with uh, support for more platforms and the new CIA emulation with uh, finally almost correct timing. Well, correct timing was a bit far-fetched uh, as we know now <laughs> but uh, yeah so now that I've talked about uh, how uh, Vice started um, let me show you how we actually tackled the problem of an accurate and fast emulation and what we did was uh, this fast emulator loop using um, an event list instead of the per clock cycle calls um, because when we do this uh, in each clock cycle for example the, the CIA timer just advances by one value yeah, the timer counts one and um, you don't need to count it every time you actually uh, in, in each and every clock cycle but you only need to count uh, you take uh, care of it when it underflows and it reaches zero and then you have to change it to uh, to the reset the value so um, when you start the timer um, the timer registers an event that says okay I need to um, si uh, count n clock cycles so give me an event in n clock cycles so then I can take care of the underflow of the timer and uh, using this um, event list we were able to mostly run within the CPU loop and uh, actually use these clock plus plus again not jumping out of the loop most of the time only when we have this uh, event clock uh, here to handle um, the different subsystems however when we read a value and we read the values, for example, from the CIA uh, or, the, or the sound chip or VIC chip. We need to update that specific chip only uh, to the current clock value. And that's how we did this um, fast emulation. So, but the CPU is not enough. As I said, we have the VIC chip, the CIA chip, memory mappings, um, and everything. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about now is the complex interface adapter, the SIA, uh, 
um, 6526, which uh, has two timers that need to be emulated. They're mostly counting the system clocks, um, but are also extensively used in games and demos. And uh, accessing the CIA timers, timer registers, changes the timer value and the behavior and the status registers uh, in a rather complicated way. The emulation that I did was uh, use, supported the events list approach, of course. Um, but uh, before we can go into the real emulation, uh, as always, we have to understand how the hardware works. And um, we were lucky because uh, Wolfgang Lorenz had already analyzed the CIA with the first cycle exact emulation for the PC64 emulator. Um, he had actually done some uh, hardware state engine description um, of the system that you can actually use in uh, in an emulator. Um, so if you look at uh, this diagram here, uh, we have a, a counter value and we have an input signal, an output signal, we have some logic gates and we have some delay uh, gates. And those those delay gates uh, add additional states beside the actual counter value. So for example when you change the timer input it takes two clock cycles before it gets actually uh, to the to the counter. So um, when, you, when you start the counter it takes two cycles before it actually starts counting. Yeah. And uh, this state needs to be emulated and uh, with with the diagrams provided by uh, Wolfgang Lorenz, I was able to actually build a state machine where you can have all those states as separate bits um, and uh, actually compute um, how those steps evolve um, with with time. So you can have a, a lookup table when I have this state at clock cycle. N, uh, I can look up the state of clock cycle N plus 1, which is very nice, it's very easy. You just need to set up the table and uh, just look up a new value every clock cycle. Um, however, as uh, mentioned before, that, that's very slow. Um, so we had to look at the optimization also. Um, what we also did is um, to ensure that the time emulation is accurate. We did a lot of test programs um, besides the demos that were already available and um, we have uh, developed specific test programs ourselves and we have analyzed non-working games. Sometimes uh, we found bugs in the games and not in the emulator. Um, one, one game I remember was Impossible Mission, um, which is a kind of jump and run game, and you run through a set of caves, and in one cave when you jump into the wall to the left in one specific cave, your player would die. And I was, that, that was on the left side of the screen, and I was uh, really looking into that, and couldn't find uh, uh, the, the bug in the emulator. And I finally decided to actually play that game on the real machine um, and found your player dies there as well. So it was a bug in the game, not in, not in the emulator. So um, how do we do the, uh, the emulation of the CIA in, in, in Vice then? Um, the state machine approach goes well in, into emulation. As I said, you just have to look up the new value here in this table. So this is the clockwise emulation, um, but as I also said, it's it's really, really very slow. So uh, because you have to count every clock cycle um, yeah, separately. But we know that we, um, there are certain uh, conditions under which we can do shortcuts. Uh, because uh, 
we don't call the CIA timer every clock cycle. We only call it and update it to the current clock, clock value when we need it. So when we start the, the timer, we know in the next n clock cycles we don't do much except uh, count the timer and that's it and there's not much uh, uh, state changes in between uh, so we can we can do that as um, as a warp count we just add that um, you can see that in in the warp counting section uh, the problem is that the condition under which we can uh, do this warp counting uh, is a bit complicated. I don't want to go <laughs> into detail here, uh, only to say that each of these constant values masks out a bit of the of the state value that we currently uh, that we currently have. So it's a really rather complicated condition on the actual timer state in which we're allowed to do um, warp counting or fast forward counting. Here's uh, there's another one which, which then stops and um, we um, took some some tweaking in the beginning it uh, didn't work it worked well except for one game which set the counter to one and one was also the condition um, due to cycle counting and of course then we had to do, add another um, condition on the um, for the warp counting to um, to handle this case. Um, another chip I did on the device emulator was the CRTC cathode ray tube controller emulation. Worked basically similar to the CIA emulation first doing a hardware analysis then building a kind of state engine in software and um, working working on that and, and doing all the event um, event queue approach and uh, now even graphics effects are available in the pet emulator um, if you haven't seen the no pets allowed demo I suggest you rather try it out Vice has a lot of settings and options and um, you can not only select which uh, machine you actually want to emulate, but also which different type of model you want to emulate. For example, you have here model settings for the C64. You can select which video chip model you want to have, because each of those have different timings, for example, different features. And the same for the SID and the CIAs. And for the uh, another, another setting here is the render filter. Here you can actually um, say uh, and, and switch on the CRT emulation that actually blurs the image to, to give you a feeling you're watching that on an old style TV set. Or you can uh, leak the video signal to the audio signal so you have specific um, uh, video uh, video um, patterns on the screen uh, you can hear them on the on the audio signal um, interesting features that you don't have on the real machine is you have a monitor to look into the emulated machine you can stop the machine at any one time and um, you can set breakpoints that it automatically stops when it reaches a specific uh, condition and uh, look into the machine and see what what is the state, what are the registers of the CPU, what are the values of the of the different chips, and you can do snapshots. You can you can store the full state of the emulator into a disk file and resume it later on. Kind of a mega safe game feature. So this gives you an overview on uh, on on Vice. A next step. Okay, what I'm showing you here now is um, a demo from uh, 1999, uh, 1990, sorry, um, which is loading, and um, this is the emulator window. Um, 
you have some some controls here you see the disk uh, image that is actually attached um, here is the uh, disk drive indicator and right here the demo has already started with some uh, typical scroller um, when you uh, press the space key then it actually continues and you can see here um, the disk drive is loading now it's done loading you can see the track where the disk drive is, is doing it's computing something and um, then gives you this uh, selection menu so in this demo you can actually select different types of demo um, with the joystick and here this uh, claims to have a filled vector logo um, so let's let's try that out you can see here again the disk drive is loading uh, next part of the demo and here it comes computing something and uh, so still computing And then you have the demo. And here what you see is the vector filled uh, logo. At least that's what it claims. So the effect that I can show you here, for example, is uh, because uh, as I said, Moore's law has given us much more computing power. You can actually go into warp mode and run the system at what you can see here is uh, uh, over 10 times the original uh, speed now um, switching it uh, uh, switching it back to normal normal mode and here you can see we have a lot of lot of different options in the in the uh, in the emulator, yeah. And uh, when you look at this particular setting, you can actually uh, see there's double scan enabled, that which means that um, if I stop, oops, wrong. If I stop it, I don't think it comes out in the in the recording, but uh, you can see here um, that between each pixel line there is a there is a, actually a blank pixel line now that I've uh, switched uh, the double scan off. And if I switch double scan on uh, and continue that, uh, well, it, it even on my screen doesn't give any much, much of a difference. Ah, but the reason for that is actually because we have CRT emulation. Uh, we have the render filter here uh, and if you go to un you see this is then uh, the CRT blur which you can actually put in here <laughs> you can switch it off and you go on uh -huh. now what you see what you can see is um, there's a lot of more of the ladder effect uh, that you get uh, because there's no blur in it. The, the also um, uh, text is is much sharper, but also more more pixelated, and uh, this is because this is what what it really looks like when you're going all digital uh, without without the blur effect of the real machine. So now when we switch off double scan, what you can now see here is that uh, the lines actually, it's not as bright as before because every second line basically is, is a blank line uh, and you can only see more or less half of the lines here. Um, those are features uh, in the emulator and another feature in the emulator is uh, You can go 
into the monitor. So what it now does, what it now does is you are in the uh, in the monitor. You can uh, see directly what the computer does. You can see the the state of the CPU. You can see the address, register, accumulator, X, Y, register, stack pointer, status registers, and and some more of them. Um, you can actually see what it's really doing. It's very interesting here because um, it actually jumps to itself, which means this is an endless loop, uh, which, which gives a hint that uh, this demo more or less only works in the in the interrupt. So um, when the when the CPU gets an interrupt, it runs into inter in the interrupt routine, and then the the actual demo is done. The next demo I'm uh, going to show you is a demo from. Um, 2009, and it's more typical of the of the modern times, um, and has really really nice effects. Um, for example, what you can see here, um, the computer screen normally has a border. That is because on the TV sets, you you couldn't put the video until the edge of the of the actual screen area. Uh, because all the TV sets were different, and so you never knew how much of that would would be shown on on anyone's TV set. So the video chip actually has these borders built in, and uh, it already is an amazing feat to well, open the borders and actually show something here, um, which we know is uh, that those are you, you can't show actual graphics in in that sense from from the from the graphics buffer. Uh, but you can um, show uh, sprite information um, from from the video chip here, and this opens the uh, the borders for for sprites. Um, okay. Well, the same the same here. Uh, what you can see here is um, it actually uh, the the sprite comes from the top border. Of the screen. Very nice effects. And uh, you've just seen it moving out of the side border also, which means that it has opened the side border in that case as well. So you can see that here again opening up uh, the, the side borders to show the sprite information there. Nice picture. Um, so and if you look at this, this is a one megahertz machine. And uh, the whole screen area of a high-res graphics screen actually takes you um, one and a half uh, frames to clear uh, by CPU, which is not even copying something in there uh, or even calculating something in there. So this is uh, much, much faster. So you really have to do some clever tricks in doing that with a with a mo one megahertz machine. It's really, I think, it's really awesome. So here again. Um, here you have a, a, a screen effect um, where you have two high-res images, and uh, it's it's basically impossible for the CPU to actually copy an image from from one side to the other side or, or, or in, into the screen buffer. So what it actually does or must be doing, I, I didn't really investigate that, is uh, during the the little time that is within this. Uh, in, in this line here that is moving around the screen, uh, switch uh, the screen buffer of the video chip and the C64 uh, from one 16K page to another 16K page um, so that it takes a graphics information uh, from, from a completely different picture. Um, has some implications concerning colors and uh, things like that, but uh, it's really an amazing effect.
again here what you see this is a one megahertz machine and uh, the effects are really are really awesome for such a for such a actually rather slow machine here's a nice picture and then oops this is really amazing what you can do with a sing simple one megahertz machine I have no idea how they did that one okay so I'm scrolling picture and this is awesome this is really 3D uh, rendering of of a maze. Uh, like uh, you know, if you, if you know these 3D shooter games, um, you can actually have it on a C64 as well. And uh, this is really amazing what people get out of this one megahertz machine. And uh, yeah. And this is computed in real time. This is uh, awesome. Another demo I'm going to show you is uh, a real neat one. Um, I'm also showing you the snapshot feature because uh, when I start uh, the emulator of the WIC20, uh, it basically directly jumps into the game that I'm going to show you. And this is really amazing. Um, because this is Doom and it has been ported to the VIC-20 which is really an amazing thing uh, you can run around in that uh, labyrinth you can move And you can actually, uh, you can walk around and see, this is, this is, this is just crazy. <laughs> so, uh, and if I find, find one of those, uh, unfortunately, of course, it's, uh, it's rather, uh, slow, uh, small because after all, it's still, it's still just a one megahertz machine. Um. But it still is amazing. You can actually shoot. I just can't find any of those barrels that you can shoot to kill. <laughs> and of course, the last demo um, has to be the one that gives you mission accomplished. Um, because this is the program, the, my favorite game. Uh, that I was unable um, to do on the C64. Yeah, my favorite breakout. Uh, yeah, I used to be better on that one. <laughs> so now to summarize um, device features. Um, Vice is the Commodore emulator, especially for the PET and the CBM2. It's highly accurate, runs on many platforms. There's even an Android port now. Android. Still under active development, but there are also uh, other emulators uh, out there. CCS64, Frodo, also C64 and multi-platform. There's Javic, JavaScript Vic20, Power20 for the Mac. Um, and the competition is always good um, to give you a motivation to improve uh, the actual system, your actual emulator. Emulation can also do uh, other things. For example, you can run uh, Windows XP and uh, you can run an Archon Arch Archimedes emulator. Uh, and in that Archon Archimedes uh, emulator, you can actually run a Sinclair Static Spectrum emulator emulator in a box um, there's also 
a 6502 emulation in Minecraft now. Um, so you have a 6502 uh, running running in a Minecraft game. I haven't tried it out, but it looks funny. Um, another thing today, JavaScript is getting more and more popular. There are a number of uh, JavaScript-based emulators for the 6502. And uh, there are some emulations of other iconic computers, for example, uh, the Cray 1A. And uh, this is uh, the original ran with 80 megahertz and had uh, 32 megabytes of memory. Uh, this uh, homebrew Cray 1A replica is emulated in an FPGA, so it uses a hardware based approach. Uh, it's really amazing what's possible today. Cr the Cray 1 really was a supercomputer at its day. Um, and today you, you have it in a program programmable logic chip. Um, you can also have in-system emulators that, uh, that replace the real hardware. For example, you can uh, take out the 6502 from a 6502 computer uh, and connect it with this uh, the cable shown here to card for the multi-board computer I showed in the very beginning and um, uh, I used my my multi-board computer to actually test new ROM versions for the Commodore disk drive replacing the Commodore disk drive CPU uh, with that with that cable to my self-built computer An emulator can can be used for a lot of different purposes. Um, you can you can code demos for old hardware. Uh, you can analyze software, especially the monitor and snapshot functionalities um, are really good for that. Do reverse engineering and problem analysis. Um, dig digital pre preservation digital preservation is uh, is another important part. My uh, version my uh, work in this area actually actually started kind of in in that area because of my favorite computer game I couldn't play anymore. Um, you can keep legacy code running. I've heard of some people running uh, very old um, program code in an emulator in actually in a production environment. Um, and you can design and develop new systems. You can actually write an emulator before you actually design uh, or, or have the hardware for that specific system. Emulation is uh, also used in virtual virtual machines. Um, and, and there's two different kinds, non-native and native system. Non-native system means the host CPU is different from, from the emulated one, emulated one. Um, you run software written to the specs of the guest. For example, you can run Mac 68K code on a Power Mac, or today Power PC code uh, on an Intel Mac. You can also have Windows Virtual PC on a on a Power PC Mac. Vice is of the same type. Um, if if you want to stretch that a little bit, you can you could even say Java a virtual machine or Pascal P code would would be like that. But um, the non-native system, the the Java bytecode or Pascal P code, or even the the Sweet 16 is is, uh, is not a real system. It's it's more a language. Um, emulation of native systems means that the host CPU is the same or compat compatible to the emulated one. Uh, it's also called CPU virtualization sometimes, um, but uh, I/O like network cards and disk drive adapters are often emulated, and it's used in for VMware server, Microsoft virtual servers, vir Windows virtual PC on Windows. So emulation is uh, is still a very current topic. So as a wrap up. Emulation can be used to accurately emulate historic computers and run historic 
software or classic com software. WISE is a great example for Commodore machines. To implement such an emulator, you have to really know the hardware of the emulated machine uh, in detail. Um, and with today's available computing power, um, you can even emulate uh, supercomputers of those days easily. Um, whether a software-based emulation uh, is, is a real replacement for a classic computer uh, is left for discussion. So that's it, and thanks for watching.